All right. Well, Adam Myers, uh, CrowdStrike's Senior Vice President of Intelligence. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, there's certainly a lot to talk about as it relates to cyber. It's um, basically been one of the most important problems of recent years. And I just kind of want to start with your background and how did you get into the cybersecurity space? Like, Take us back to even your earliest years of how you got interested in being involved in this space. All right. Well, at the at the risk of dating myself, my first computer was a 3D6. Uh, if you remember those old uh, running Windows and DOS, it was uh, it was a bit of a clunker. But um, back in those days, if you wanted to get a video game running, you would need to mess with the memory and and different settings inside of the operating system to actually have enough power to run the video game. And by the time I got the video game running, I found that I was not so interested in the game itself anymore, but what it took to get that game running. And from there, it kind of, you know, turned into me dialing into bulletin board systems, which were kind of the the forerunner to the internet back in the the mid nineties. And one day I got an America online uh, CD in the, in the mail and I, uh, I plugged it in and I ended up going on to America Online, which was kind of the first foray into that early internet uh, space. And from there, I was I was pretty hooked. And, you know, from, you know, I, I was really interested in computers, how they work, but security, I was always kind of a troublemaker. So I was kind of interested in how to bypass things. Uh, one, w- one fun story, my, uh, we used to have these locks that would lock the keyboard on the computer. And I remember I, I did something and I was punished and my dad locked the, uh, the, the thing so I couldn't use the keyboard, I couldn't use the computer effectively. And I was sitting there kind of looking at it and I took the case apart and I looked at how the mechanical lock could stop the keyboard from, from working and it basically just turned off one of the wires. So I bypassed the lock and of course my father came in, the computer's open and now I'm playing video games. and. Uh, I was in even more trouble, uh, needless to say, but uh, an example of kind of how I got interested in the security side of things. Um, and then from there, I, I went into uh, college. And at college, I started studying computer science, but that kind of got in the way of my social activities. So uh, my grades suffered, and I ended up switching to political science. And then I kind of blended political science with computer science to you know really start looking at what was going on in viruses and really the first hacker war war that erupted in the summer of 2000. Wow. So you were a bit of a troublemaker. I I see. Um that was still a, am. kind of <laughs> still am, but that's probably a great skill set to have. Um so you you ended up switching majors because uh you said your grades kind of suffered, but that kind of opened you up to um you know, I guess different facets of it here. I, I guess before I really dig in, I just have a quick follow on like, obviously thing, I don't know how, how things have changed since you were in school, but if someone were interested in kind of getting into this field, what would you recommend uh, they do? Like a young I, person. You know, I, I think everybody learns differently. I'm personally, I'm self-taught. So one of the things that, you know, for somebody like me, I would recommend is start playing with something like Python, which is a programming language that you can do pretty much on any computer, any operating system. And that's really kind of the first way to start playing with making the computer do things. And that, you know, that's a step away from uh, playing with an iPad or playing with an existing uh, computer and and using a program somebody else wrote. But, you know, when you start to actually write your own code and, you know, it always starts off with something stupid. They say, hello world, right? So you, you get the computer to print that out. And that's been, you know, the type of thing that people have been learning computers for 30, 40 years have, have done this hello world kind of exercise. But once you, once you do that, once you get that first step under your belt, then you start to explore and you start to understand a little bit more. Um, so for, for me, that was kind of uh, just playing, hacking around, self-taught. Some people learn better from books. Some people learn better from podcasts and things like that. So it's it's really, I think you have to be honest about what your aptitude and, and capability for learning is and, and start with that as kind of your jump off point. Yeah. I do know print hello world. That's about as far as I go uh, when it comes to computer programming. Um, okay. So I want to talk about what you do now um, and, and your what, what you basically look after. Um, so tell me a bit more about your work these days. 
Yeah, well, you know, let me let me transition from that college experience. So in the summer of 2000, um, a lot of people probably don't remember this, but there was a P-3 Orion, which is a uh, U.S. anti-submarine warfare aircraft. It's used for uh, surveillance and spy missions. And it was flying off the coast of China, and it got bumped by a Chinese fighter jet, and it had to land. It made an emergency landing at Hainan Island in China, and the, the Chinese kept it. Right. And the crew, they didn't uh, take the precautions they were supposed to. They didn't destroy the crypto cryptographic gear and things like that on the system, on the plane. And so when it crashed in Hainan Island, the Chinese were able to start reverse engineering it, taking it apart, figuring out how it works, what it does, what its capabilities are, so they could better defend against it and understand how to build their own version of it effectively. And that summer, I can remember vividly that on the news, there would be pictures of this plane sitting on a tarmac in Hainan Island, and they had stripped it apart. They were taking it apart. We could see them doing this. And a hacker war erupted. And at the time, I'm studying in political science at George Washington University, and I was taking a class called Coercive Diplomacy. And I was looking at what was happening in uh, China, and I saw this Chinese hacker army start to emerge. And there was a US side to it too. And these two different kind of factions started doing website defacements throughout that summer and effectively trying to run their own propaganda against the other side. And I thought that was fascinating. So I started writing my paper for that class on cyber warfare at the time. We called it information warfare as a means of course of diplomacy. And that, you know, I remember the professor was kind of like, no idea how you got here or what this is, but this seems interesting. And, you know, that that kind of tucked away that political science part of my brain until uh, a few years later when I was working for a defense contractor. And I had started off doing pen testing, which penetration testing means that you're simulating a bad guy. You're simulating a hacker trying to break into a system and then you give the system owner, you know, kind of the things that they need to fix. And here's, here's how I got in. And here's, here's what you should, should beef up in terms of tools or process or, or, or personnel or whatever it might be. And um, when I kind of got to this point of doing that, I started reverse engineering software again to look for vulnerabilities. And that caused me to pivot into reverse engineering malware, the tools that are used by hackers across the globe. And I started working in uh, the government sector for, I was over at the State Department and was responsible for tracking threat actors by reverse engineering code. And this all kind of came back together and started kind of looking at the political aspects of why some of these state governments were doing these cyber operations, espionage or otherwise. And that really kind of put me in a position where I understood that there was a cyber tool being leveraged by foreign nation states, hostile nation states against the U.S. government and and U.S. businesses to steal information, which they would then use for their own either political, military or economic advantage. Yeah, a lot a lot to unpack there. Um, Just real quick, like from your time um, as a pen tester, um, do you have any like stories that you're allowed to share? Anything kind of crazy, anything memorable from those times? I mean, I, I worked on a lot of different um, different environments in the civilian, military, intelligence community. I was I was all over the place working uh, on these projects. Uh, you know, I think um, <laughs> one that comes to mind. Unfortunately, there was a, a system that we were pen testing, and w- it was a web server. And I was I was trying to write a uh, a tool that I would be able to then connect to that web server directly with, and I couldn't write it. And, and I'm, I'm uploading it and it's just not working. And I was like, this should be working. Why isn't it working? So I changed the file name so it would write it to a different place. And it worked. And then when I finally connected to that system and started poking around, I realized that I had compromised that system a year before when I pen tested it. And they never cleaned it up. And they never, they, they never removed the, the tool that I dropped. And so the same exact technique worked a year later. Interesting. Um, that's, wow, um, that they took them a year to clean it up. Okay, so let's kind of fast forward, um, because you talked about this paper you wrote in college, the beginning of the hacker wars um, from that moment in 2000. 
How have you seen this evolve over the last 20 or so years, these hacker wars and the severity of them? Walk me through kind of the evolution of what you've seen. Well, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the hackers on the Chinese side, for example, that had been engaged in that that back and forth in the, the summer of 2000, they ended up becoming what what is now you know effectively the old guard of of chinese hackers Uh, they run companies they have different uh contests and and are you know speaking at events and have become kind of the the godfathers of of the chinese hacking scene and and have their their tools and their techniques have made it into a lot of the operations that we associate with china today um, and so it's kind of interesting seeing how they grew up and grew into these professionalized roles. And, and I did a, a, the same way uh, on different sides of the ocean. And it, it, it's an interesting kind of dichotomy there in that ha- how the two things have evolved. Um, you know, I think today, you know, if you go back to 2009, 2010, there was this kind of period where organizations were getting compromised by China. And they were coming out, they were going public, and they were saying, we were hacked by this advanced persistent threat. And that was code for China. And what China was doing at the time was stealing uh, economic uh, tools, things that they could use and and develop domestically to advance their own industries. And so companies started kind of claiming that they had these advanced persistent threat issues, and that was kind of it. But um, we, at at that time, I'd started this uh, company uh, sort of working for this company that I helped build called CrowdStrike. And we were looking at these threats to businesses and trying to help businesses understand how they could best defend against these threats. And we started helping them to understand that if you know who these threat actors are, how they operate, you know, this isn't magic. There's a human behind it. And if you understand who that human is, what they're after, then you're in a better position to defend against it. And so this began what for the last 10 plus years we've been building um, at, at this at CrowdStrike, um, which you know, we would say it's, it's kind of intelligence driven defense, intelligence dr- driven security, where you understand what the threat is and you build your defenses uh, to make sure that you are able to effectively deal with it. Mm-hmm. You mentioned um, a few things there. Um, so these folks who were part of on the other side, um, on, on the Chinese side, you kind of mentioned them as like the godfathers of the hacking scene, and now they're in corporations in in China. Talk to like I want to hear more about that. Are they, they're just like public facing now? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, one of the the barrier to entries for understanding what's happening in China is being able to speak Mandarin, and so we have a lot of um, intelligence analysts that work for my team that are you know they understand Mandarin and they're able to go through and read esoteric publications and they're looking at conference notes and things of that nature. And, you know, some of the original hackers, um, I remember some of the tools that were built uh, by uh, by Lion and and, and others that um, at the time were used for kind of automated website defacement. And then those tool names and those those kind of hackers tend to have this kind of handle, uh, which is their their online uh, identifier. And so a lot of those kind of carried over from the hacking scene into the professional scene. And uh, we've seen that elsewhere, too. We've seen that in the Iranian hacking scene, for example, which has uh, evolved quite a bit also over the last 10 or so years. And um, what, you know, your effectively career path, I guess, from a from a underground hacker uh, even if you're just an enthusiast perspective, is that you kind of start off doing things at the amateur level uh, for your own interest and, and edification. And as you start to either develop a company or develop a career, uh, you progress, but you always kind of have those roots and you always have the things that you did before. And that's kind of the foundation of what you do next. Yeah. Um, talk to me a bit more about um, this economic espionage against the U.S. Uh, by China. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a way to quantify it, but just kind of shed a bit more light on the situation because it sounds to me like it's pretty severe over the last several years. I think the way to quantify it, I forgot who it was. Somebody on the U.S. government side said that it was the greatest transfer of economic wealth in human history. Um, 
what effectively has been happening, and if you look at China's economic roadmap and, and strategy, uh, right now they're in something called the 14th Five-Year Plan. The five-year plan is China's roadmap for what they're going to do over the next five years to develop their economy, to develop their, their, their industries and their tech. And in this five-year plan, there's a lot around cloud computing, uh, a lot around microchip technology, uh, a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And there's, uh, it's effectively the roadmap for all the things that they want to develop, which you could also interpret as their shopping list, things that they're going to target for economic espionage. In China, they have state-owned enterprises. So the state actually owns private, what here would be a private industry. And they're able to leverage some of the offensive cyber capabilities to conduct espionage to enable those, those domestic state-owned enterprises and technologies to leapfrog. So what they'll do is they'll take the existing state of the art, they'll, they'll, they'll steal it either through, and China has been doing this for years with joint ventures. Uh, if you're trying to build, uh, get access to the Chinese market and, and, and develop your own, uh, you know, customer set there, they'll, they'll effectively force you into a joint venture or some other partnership. Uh, which may include uh, technology transfer agreement and things uh, along those lines. And a lot of companies over the years have jumped on that because what they see that as a long-term uh, problem for a short-term gain. And so there's a lot of organizations that went into these joint ventures and got into these technology transfers either because they trusted their partners there or they thought, we're not going to worry about that. That's a, that's a tomorrow problem when there's a today profit be made. And so joint ventures are one mechanism. There's also human espionage. We, we see quite a bit of that still today where um, there's things like the thousand talents program. Um, and they're, they're putting uh, Chinese uh, students, they're putting um, Chinese interns into American businesses to try to develop uh, long-term access to some of that technology, some of that, uh, know-how. And they're also taking U.S. professors and, and people and, and basically taking them on these lavish all expense uh, paid trips through China in order to basically bring them onto the side of thinking that China's here to help, right? China's a friend and an ally. And the third mechanism by which they do this, uh, there's again, you know, the, the, human techno uh, the human assets, the technology transfer and joint venture and then their cyber espionage mm -hmm. and cyber espionage really picked up uh, publicly in, in the 2010 timeframe when there was this so-called Operation Aurora. And I think that opened everybody's eyes to the fact that, hey, this is clearly Chinese activity. It's been mapped to all of these different goals and objectives and they're stealing technology. And that really started uh, for the next five or so years that really started a dialogue about what are we going to do about this and how are we going to impact this? Yeah, and to that point, uh, what what is being done about it, um, and what do you see that's actually working, or what can be, what more could be done? Well, you know, I think we, we're starting to make some good progress. Um, in you know, th there I mentioned the fourteenth five year plan, but that's not the only one. There's also uh, the Made in China twenty twenty five initiative. There is the Belt and Road Initiative and the the Digital Silk Road. So there's there's a number of different ongoing uh, activities that China has been engaged in. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, their goal is to become the regional hegemon and ultimately global hegemon, right? They want to contest the United States and they want to bring their own vision of the region and then ultimately the world to fruition. I think that the CHIPS Act that recently passed is a good step in the right direction. We're entirely too dependent on um, Taiwanese and, and other um, chip manufacturing. Uh, we are you know, not building the chips domestically anymore. And I think that CHIPS Act starts to put us in the right direction in terms of building microchips here again and, and really uh, not relying. And I think some of that was fueled by the pandemic and the supply chain shortages that occurred. But what 
it amounts to is building chips domestically, I think is important for national security. And it's also important for our ability to push back against China uh, when they start to encroach on Taiwan or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned um, China wanting to be the global hegemon. I've certainly heard many other folks bring this up as well. Um, I guess from like the the economic espionage, corporate espionage aspect, gosh, is it is it too late for this? Is it too late? Are they too far ahead in terms of, um, you know, taking American IP and technology? Is there anything that can be done to mitigate this further? What do you think? I don't think that they're, it's too late. I think that, you know, they have been very effective. Look around the world and what they're doing. And we can always, we can always push back. We can always be more assertive, but they have heavily invested in Africa. They've heavily invested in Latin America. A few weeks ago, I was in Israel and in Tel Aviv, uh, Chinese companies are building the metro. They're building the port. They're building a port up in Haifa. Um, this is all part of their digital uh, and Belt and Road Initiative. And, and so um, when they start to do those deals, they come with strings attached. You have to use their telecom equipment from Huawei. You have to use um, different uh, services. You have to, to bring all of these things into, into your country and into your infrastructure. And we can start to roll that back. You know, I, I think that the states that are going for this, um, they're taking these deals. I know there was a deal, I think it was in um, Ecuador, where they, they realized that they'd gotten kind of uh, under China's thumb and they started pushing back. So, you know, I think it, it can be pushed back and I think that we can contest what they're doing, but it requires us to have a strategy. What, what would be a smart strategy? What would be a smart strategy? Um, well, I think that You know, the CHIPS initiative is a good example of moving in the right direction, right? Realizing that we have a vulnerability, right? Maybe this kind of comes back to that pen testing discussion a little bit, right? We have a vulnerability in that we're dependent on foreign chips. So let's let's address that. Let's start building foundries and making chips here in the United States. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more thoughtful in how we do international uh, relationships and and building those relationships with allies across the globe. I, I think uh, just this week, it was an interesting wake up call when a Coast Guard cutter went to the Solomon Islands and was uh, not allowed to to, to dock uh, and to enter. And I think that that is a prime example of the expanding influence of China uh, across the Pacific. And it's not just there, it's it's elsewhere. Yeah. I think a lot of these countries, though, you know, in many cases will have buyer's remorse. And that is an opportunity for us to now work a little bit more closely with them. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, OK, let's zoom out a bit and just kind of frame up um, maybe a bit of a broader landscape of cyber, cyber threats, especially, especially um, you know, targeting companies, um, probably maybe even individuals here in the U.S. Can you just kind of frame it up for me? And the listeners? Yeah. So, you know, when I think about the threats that are out there, they really fit into three categories that we see. um, And, you know, CrowdStrike now has uh, customers all over the globe. So we see quite a bit of activity. We track 185 threat actors um, that, that we are continuously tracking across the globe. We track about 30 or 40 activity clusters, which are ones that we have visibility into, but we're not sure where they originate. Um, nation states make up quite a bit of that, and that is, you know, they engage in espionage. They also engage, as we've seen in, in uh, the case of Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere, uh, disruptive, destructive activities. We've seen Iran do that as well, North Korea. And they, you know, they, they do sabotage and, uh, and inf- disinformation, misinformation. So that's kind of the nation state threat. Then we have criminals. Criminals have evolved over the years and are, you know, I'd say that they're financially motivated, right? They're they're revenue driven, uh, coin operated, if you will. And what that used to amount to was a lot of account wire fraud, right? They'd steal your banking credentials or your credit card information and, and try to conduct wire fraud with that information. How that's evolved over the last couple of years has been into ransomware, 
and we're seeing it evolve again into data extortion. We'll come back to that in a second. But the third kind of thing, just to frame it up, finish framing it up, the third thing that we see, nation state, financially motivated criminal actors, and then hacktivists. And hacktivists are kind of politically motivated actors, generally lower sophistication, who will do website defacements. Uh, increasingly, they're doing what we call hack and leak operations, where they'll break into a juicy target and leak sensitive information. And uh, they'll also do a lot of distributed denial of service attacks where they try to knock a website offline. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the interesting thing that we've seen on the last two, both financially motivated and hacktivists, um, and even to a certain extent, nation states, has been this growing trend of data weaponization. And what that means is that they're stealing sensitive information and then weaponizing it against the victim. Um, it could be at the individual level, it could be at the corporation level. Um, but the goal there is to, you know, from a financially motivated side, they steal your information and then try to make you pay them to not release it on the hack and leak stuff. And also the nation leak, uh, nation state, um, you know, for example, we've seen Iranian threat actors uh, conducting what we call lock and leak operations mm -hmm. where they create fake ransomware uh, or disingenuous ransomware. They break into a target, they lock everything up with the ransomware to distract them, they steal information, and then they leak it to the internet uh, in order to either delegitimize the target or to uh, damage their credibility or to expose some, some, some things that might be damaging to their, their ability to operate. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I want to explore, there's a lot of things in there that I would love to just ask you about because <laughs> you're the expert on this and I'm certainly not, but... It's really interesting to me. So this data weaponization, can you give us an example of where this has happened? And then we can kind of start to uh, peel it back. Yeah, it's happening all over the place. You know, we see 40 or 50 of them a week right now. And, you know, um, let's say, uh, I, I guess from a timeliness perspective right now, it's back to school, right? Lots of, lots of kids are going back to school. Lots of parents are trying to get their kids back to school uh, so that they can, they can get their jobs done. And what some of these threat actors will do is they'll hack into those school districts and they'll deploy ransomware, but they'll also steal information. And, you know, one of the, the things that can be very damaging there is if they're stealing student records and they're stealing uh, sensitive files about faculty and then they post that to the Internet, uh, there is real uh, impact from that. So they're doing that this time of year because they want to go after a target that they know is going to be likely to pay. Mm -hmm. And so they're going after organizations that they think that if they steal information, threaten to disclose it, that they can compel them to pay a ransom or, or, or an extortion demand. Should do, do people actually pay? Oh yeah. Yeah. They make millions and millions of dollars doing this. Why, I just, I'm curious, like why, why would someone pay? Like why not get the authorities involved? Cause I, I don't, why would someone do that? Are they allowed to do that? That's a great question. So, you know, think about data privacy right now. You know, there's things like the California Privacy Act, and I think Colorado's got one going, and I'm sure, you know, most states are not far behind. And what, you know, then you have things across, you know, Europe, like GDPR and, and other privacy-related uh, legal frameworks that are out there. What that means is that you as a victim lose that information. You're actually liable for losing the information, right? So the legal compliance regulatory costs of that information being disclosed are going to be astronomical compared to what the data extortion demand might be. And so organizations do pay. Wow. Do you have like an obligation to report like, okay, I, I, I got extorted. I paid the, let's call it 3 million off. Um, do you, they have to report that, right? I would assume so, right? Depends. Um, it depends on where they're located. It depends on, um, you know, if they're like publicly traded or not. So there, there's different, different reasons why they would have to report it. But in the U.S. right now, there's no, you know, regulation that you have to report a cyber breach. I know that in Australia, I think they just, they just uh, published that law. They, they've got a new law that you have to report it. And they've had, uh, I think, you know, some uh, some reporting already come in as a result of that. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was just alarming, like the, just the sheer number you mentioned um, per week that happened that you all um, yeah. see. 
Let me let me put it uh, this way. We see, I think the last time I checked, we see about 46 or so ransomware data extortion. We call this big game hunting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I can explain why in a second. But we see about 46 of those every week. The average demand is somewhere around three to four million dollars right now. About this time last year, it was closer to six million dollars. And so think about what that looks like in terms of the potential revenue for these criminal actors is absolutely uh, incredible. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of mind boggling when you, when you break it down that way. Um, I just have another question because, um, $135 million a week, a week in extortion. Is that just in the U S or globally? That's globally. Globally. Okay. Still, it's about but the U.S. is probably the primary target. Yeah, U.S. is primary target. Um, just to stay on this topic though of like data weaponization, um, like I want to bring up an example with you. Was remember, remember that you remember this the the Sony hack, and that was after I believe the story. Maybe you can tell it. It was after the movie, the interview. Is that correct? Where there's a that was, was yep. okay. Can you retell that story? And was that an example of data weaponization when they released? that is that oh i i you know i i guess um if you think back to what happened there uh seth rogan and uh james franco right yeah james franco they they did this movie where they were gonna assassinate kim jong-un and in i think this happened uh it definitely happened on the tuesday before thanksgiving in 2014 um and they had, you know, in September of that year, I think that they had said that if this movie gets released, it would be considered an act of war. And as a result, uh, two months later, as the movie is about to be released, Sony gets hacked. Sony Pictures Entertainment gets hacked and a wiper is deployed. Um, and then there was a bunch of email spools that were uh, stolen and and released. And I think that, you know, from a data weaponization perspective, that there was a, a goal there, right? And so that that was a very interesting case. So it was North Korean actors, right? We looked at the malware and it mapped back to things that we had been tracking for years that we associate with North Korea. They clearly had the motive uh, given the release of this movie. They had threatened that they were going to do something about it. And when they did the attack though they pretended to be a hacktivist group they called themselves guardians of peace or gop and they had this whole you know persona that they created to make it seem as if they were actually hacktivists that were pissed about something with sony and then the release that stolen information i think one as a way to disrupt sony from releasing the movie and two uh i think it was also a a, a bit of a, a smokescreen Right, because the hack was messy, things were wiped, and then there's data leaking, and they were really trying to put pressure on the investigators, the incident response teams that were involved to just kind of come at them from every angle so that it would, you know, make the story more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the reason I'm, I, I'm just curious about it too, because when you have these moments where you have data leaked by hackers, um, I just wonder, because I, I was a journalist for, gosh, I was a journalist for 10 years. Um, I guess I'm still kind of a journalist. I'm hosting a podcast now, obviously, but it Absolutely. just makes me wonder, like, um, because there's a lot of coverage sometimes of these leaks, um, whether it's, you know, a trove of emails that comes out or, or whatever it is. And it's, sometimes it's the coverage of the content that's in there. Doesn't, wouldn't that just only fuel like hackers to want to even do this even more when, when there's coverage of the actual content from the stolen or leaked um, or compromised data? Well, that's what they're counting on, right? Um, by, by leaking that information, the kind of context there is that we're going to leak this and the journalists and your customers and the lawyers, they're going to be all over this data. And, you know, that's a great question because we just started seeing in the last couple of weeks that some of these threat actors have begun making it easier to comb through that data for journalists and for lawyers and, and for potential customers or whatever to find it. And so um, what they're doing is they're stealing that data and they're not just putting it 
in a in a folder that you can now have to go through yourself they're indexing the data so that you can search through that data very much like you would search online right through a search engine um, and so they're indexing that data to make it easily searchable and that really ratchets up the pain for the victim because now you know they, they, they don't have even time where a journalist might pull that file down to start looking through all the data uh, and they're going to have to download it and, and start to you know pick through it they could just start running queries directly on the adversary's infrastructure that they've set up to host that stolen data and we mm -hmm. call that a dedicated leak site yeah i mean okay so like yeah, maybe. Okay. It might seem like, oh, this is a great story and get some juicy information or whatnot. But I almost feel like oh, by doing that, you're like feeding into, you're giving them more incentives to do the same thing or watch other actors and replicate it. I mean, that's just my viewpoint. I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. Expert. But, you know, I think it, you look at stuff like the Panama Papers and you look at some of the things that have historically occurred with stolen information then being, uh, you know, made available for people to search through it and find juicy stories. And I think that there's, there's some journalists that might not want to cover it, but then there's others that look at that, that data and they're like, oh, this is too good. Like imagine, you know, a major law firm, all of their customers um, and, and all of the, the, the privileged uh, content that might be in there, if that becomes available, that's going to be, you know, very enticing to, to at least a subset of journalists and, and others that, that might try to take advantage of it. Yeah, no, it's a fair point, too, actually. Um, yeah, it got me thinking even further on this. It was just a curiosity. I don't know. Um, something to think about, though. Okay. Well, I, and I think you're dead on, right? Because the threat actors are trying to maximize that. So you're, you're absolutely right in thinking that, you know, there's that's a double edged sword and that, you know, you don't want to do it to fuel and to feed them into, you know, because because what happens then is, uh, you know, uh, the next victim sees that that happened, that a journalist went through that data, that they wrote all these stories from the stolen data, and then they get that extortion demand and they're like, oh, we better pay this or we're going to be next. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's just um, continue on here. Are most are most breaches avoidable? Are most breaches avoidable? Um I think that, you know, our, our tagline at CrowdStrike is we stop breaches. And so I think, um, you know, avoidance of a breach uh, means one thing, right? Which is to say, if you have proper security controls in place, that you have the right staff and the right processes, then you can avoid that breach occurring. Um, with advanced technology, with machine learning and artificial intelligence that are being delivered at the endpoint today, we can also, you know, get into a middle area where you, you're not avoiding the breach, but you're stopping it once it's in progress, right? These things don't just, it's not just like an instant in time that this breach occurs. Once they get access, we found that it takes something like 98 minutes on average for a hacker to go from getting access to your computer to moving into your servers and moving deeper into your enterprise. And once they do that, now you have to start trying to find them everywhere. And so if you can get in front of that hacker in the 98 minutes from the time that they get access to the time that they move, then you could stop that breach on one system. Um, so, you know, there's, there's levels at which you can stop these breaches. And, you know, I, I think that they should be avoidable. And, and certainly we stop these breaches every single day at CrowdStrike. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned... Um artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing. How do you, can you like elaborate a bit more on like deploying these technologies and, um, you know, I guess stopping a breach? Yeah, this sounds super complex and, and uh, deeply nerdy, but let, let me give you an example, a, a real world example here. So, you know, the state of uh, security years ago, uh, let's say 10 years ago, was that you had what we call signature based antivirus. What that means is that you had some antivirus technology on your computer. A bunch of people were looking at malware and, and malicious code. They were trying to figure out how it worked, what it looked like, and then they would write a signature for the antivirus scanner to detect um, that particular threat. 
And that's why if you if you can remember back to those days, you would have to deploy a new update every week or so with all the new signature information. And it could be gigs of information. It would take a while to load and it was pretty painful. Uh, maybe it even required a reboot. What machine learning does is rather than look for known signatures, pieces of, of things that, that somebody's analyzed and said, this is bad. Uh, what machine learning does is it looks at all of the different aspects of the file. Um, and you know, that could be a word document. It could be whatever file type we're talking about. And it looks at, you know, for, we look at billions of files, uh, every day and we look across all of those files and you look for, um, features. And a feature is just like a unique piece of information. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot here for a second, um, and give you an even simpler example. I, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, in our machine learning team did a presentation years ago that always stuck with me on this, which was they took, um, I think it was the U S army had published data about, uh, soldiers, their gender, their height, their weight, and I think the size of their butt and what effectively machine learning what you do is you could take all of those three pieces of information right height weight and circumference of butt or i don't remember what the exact measurement was right um but if you plot on a three-dimensional graph all of those things and you know that some of these data points are tied to a male some of them are tied to a female and you look at that in a three-dimensional space you could draw a line and say north of this line is probably male and south of this line is probably female. And so that's what machine learning effectively allows you to do is to take little bits of data and map it into a multidimensional space and then to be able to basically run a line through it and say, um, algorithmically, I think above this, this line, this, this gradient is X and below it is Y. And that's what we're doing with malicious files. So we don't need to ever have seen the file before. We don't ever have to have analyzed it or, or created a signature for it. We can look at the file, look at different features, different, right? And in my example, right, the male, uh, female features were height, weight, and, and circumference of butt. And um, we can take all those features about different files and basically say above this line, it's bad. And below this line, it's probably good. And we can, we can do that with a degree of confidence. In fact, just this week, we started finding some interesting files that turned out to be zero days, uh, which is an unknown vulnerability. And we were able to do that by looking at the machine learning uh, detection of a file and said, this file is bad. It says it's bad. Let's take a look at what it is. And then we started analyzing it and we realized, oh, this is, this is a, real, a new weapon. Uh, that, a, that a threat actor is using. So that's kind of the, the power of machine learning is the ability to make those determinations on things that you've never encountered before in real time and determine if it's good or bad. Wait, what do you mean um, new weapon? You mentioned z something called zero days. What's that? So um, if you think of a vulnerability is a um a weakness right a, a mm -hmm. vulnerability is 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 something that an attacker can exploit take advantage of in order to do that in software oftentimes you actually need exploit code you need some code that's going to allow you to break software in a certain way that lets you take control of it and so um along the kind of life cycle of a vulnerability uh or, or exploit um is kind of this concept that when the vendor doesn't know that there's a vulnerability in their software and it's uh, and an attacker does that's day zero right and and from that point on the you know once the vendor knows about it and patches it that might be considered a one day meaning that the you know there is a patch available and you can you can actually fix this vulnerability um, but with a zero day that's kind of the most sought after coveted tool of the uh, cybersecurity world because it means that there's no possible patch. There's no remedy for it and nobody knows that it's out there. And so this is a very powerful tool for a hacker. Mm -hmm. Well, you're teaching me things that I certainly did not know and I'm sure folks are also learning. Um, okay, so let's broaden out a little bit more and maybe like let's go around the world at some of the hostile nation states that are threatening, um, you know, maybe U.S. businesses or 
individuals. And we talked about China. We briefly brought up North Korea because of um, the Sony hack. But let's let's dig more into North Korea. And what are some of the big risks there these days? Sure. North Korea is an interesting one. They not only conduct espionage for political and military purposes, they've done disruptive, destructive attacks against U.S. businesses, but also South Korean businesses and government agencies. They also steal money. They do revenue generation. Um, You may remember back in 2016 or so that there was an incident where the Bangladeshi bank was hacked and a billion dollars was almost stolen. I think they made off with about a hundred million. And that was through a, um, a international financial system called SWIFT. And the North Korean hackers were able to figure out a weakness in the implementation of SWIFT at that bank and take advantage of it in order to try to steal funds. Well, as a result of that, North Korea was actually disconnected from SWIFT. They were not allowed to participate in this international financial network anymore. And around that time, they started going after uh, foreign ATM machines. So that there was a couple of instances where they were doing uh, what was known as a, uh, a, a cash out operation um, where they would, uh, they would uh, we call it, um, um, what are the... Uh, the machines you pull the handle on uh i know your slot machine slot machine yeah it's, yeah it's basically like doing that um with with an atm machine and so they would hack into the back end of the bank and they would go to the atm machine and basically it would approve any trans uh, any withdrawal and so they would just they would just jackpot the uh the atm machine um, would they also heavily have gone after cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency has been obviously something that's been booming for the last 10 or so years. And what they have you know, initially started doing was going after uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. And so a lot of, you know, when you think about cryptocurrency exchanges, where you're changing either fiat currency, right, traditional US dollars or whatever it might be for a cryptocurrency or your trading between different crypto blockchains. Um, And so they were going after these exchanges who, you know, I kind of say they're like fintech. They're kind of like a startup, but they also hold the money. And so they were, they were finding that a lot of these fintech companies or these, these crypto exchanges didn't have the best security practices in place. And so they were able to steal large amounts of cryptocurrency from these different cryptocurrency trading platforms um, they've also gone after online games. They've gone after, um, I think now they're, they're starting to play with NFTs and uh, that's non-fungible tokens and um, DAOs, which are uh, autonomous organizations uh, that, that are all kind of tied to cryptocurrency technology, uh, blockchain technology, I, sh- I should say. And so they've, they've been making a huge amount of revenue for the state. And if you look at North Korea, they have something that's kind of called the third office or the third floor, where they're responsible for generating revenue to drive the nuclear program or to even fund some of the, the uh, Kim family's uh, day-to-day lifestyle. And so they run these hacking operations to generate revenue for the state. Wow. Wow. Um, you mentioned the cryptocurrency ecosystem that they've been targeting as well. I, the FBI put out a, a notice on this yesterday uh, around vulnerabilities, and you mentioned that it's going toward uh, revenue generation for uh, for North Korea as well. Um, how about um, you know? Are there are there, how about other areas? Um, let's talk about you know Russia, obviously. Um, uh, with the Russia Ukraine uh, situation playing out, how about what's going on um, there as it relates to cyber? Yeah, I mean, so for since 2014 or so, Ukraine has been the playground for Russia from a cyber perspective. They've run operations there back in uh, 2014. They hacked into the election, and uh, there's a famous story where. The Russians had tried to hack into the uh, the CEC, the the Ukrainians uh, election committee, and the Ukrainian intelligence service, I think it was the SBU, put out that they had stopped this from happening. And around that same time, so what, what the hack was, um, let, me, let me briefly tell you what that looked like. So they were trying to plant a story 
that the winner in the election was a super far right wing candidate. And they said he was winning by like 30 something percent. And that this was kind of going to be the fake story that they put into that that web server. The Ukrainians stopped it. But at the same time, a coordinated news campaign amplifying the message that was supposed to be posted was run on the, the Russian uh, state news services. So they were basically trying to coordinate putting a, a fake story onto this um, election committee web server to say that a right wing candidate was winning and then use that to amplify the story. And ultimately, the message that we now hear today that there is, you know, right wing nationalist kind of uh, Nazi type uh, people in Ukraine that are tied to the government. Right. So that that narrative they've been establishing for quite some time. Um, in 2015 and again in 2016, they actually turned off the power. They were able to hack in and manipulate the power, shut the grid down for a period of time inside of Ukraine. Um, they were posting, you know, disturbing pictures and messages on on uh, screens across Kiev. Um, so, you know, they've they've been doing quite a bit in targeting of Ukraine. In fact, you may remember uh, something called NotPetya. NotPetya occurred in, I, I want to say it was... Uh, May or June 2017, and the what it's been said that that caused ten billion uh, ten billion dollars in damage globally, and what this was was, was a self propagating ransomware, and I, I do air quotes on the ransomware because it wasn't actually ransomware; it discarded the the key. So if you think about how ransomware works, it encrypts a file, and there's a, a secret key, a secret password to to decrypt the file afterwards. And if you're actually doing ransomware to make money, you need that key kind of to unlock the file after somebody pays you because you want to be seen as a legitimate you know, business person that's going to give them the key if they pay you. Um, and what this malware was doing was just discarding the key. There is no possible way to recover the files. And so this whole thing was actually a Russian uh, disruption operation targeting Ukraine but it, it propagated outside of Ukraine into Western businesses. And as a result of that, there's, you know, it's been said that there was $10, billions of dam $10 million in damage from that Napetia incident. A couple of months later, it happened again, uh, though not as wide scale with something called Bad Rabbit. So, you know, they've been experimenting in Ukraine with offensive technologies and techniques and seeing what can be done about about it and what the US and NATO would do about it as well, by the way. And so uh, they've been pretty active. But, you know, going back to February of this year, within an hour or so of uh, President Putin announcing the special operation in Ukraine, satellites started going down over Europe. And there was a wiper attack targeting the satellite uh, modems and uh, that, that had impacts across Ukraine, but also other parts of Europe. And in the first couple of weeks, we saw something like nine different wipers. Uh, wipers are disruptive, destructive tools that erase files or hard drives. We saw, uh, I think it was nine different ones being deployed against targets uh, across Ukraine. And so, you know, there has been a very uh, robust cyber uh, operation that is running parallel to the special operation, the military operation that's been occurring in Ukraine. I mean, to that point too, like, how do you, how do you see, um, maybe a bit more broadly, like cyber kind of, um, it's role or relationship in, you know, geopolitics even more broadly. Yeah. Well, so, you know, uh, let me come back to that for in one second, I'll say, uh, the other kind of unintended thing that occurred because of that Ukraine conflict was that these hacker armies started rising up. So Ukraine created the Ukraine hacker army uh, that was meant to target tar uh, different organizations in Russia. And then there has been these different Russian operations. Uh, one is called Killnet, uh, another is uh, from Russia with love. And they've been targeting Western targets and Ukrainian targets. So there's been this whole kind of, uh, you know, fifth column of, of hacktivist activity occurring and you know that has erupted from this conflict and continues today so you know one of the things that that we had written a blog about uh, a while back was that we had observed people were hacking into 
companies' resources. Um, a lot of organizations use containerization. So one of the big container technologies is Docker. And so people that were supporting Ukraine were hacking into exposed Docker instances to deploy uh, DDoS tools that would target entities in Russia. So what that means is, as an American business or a Western business that has a poorly configured Docker infrastructure, you could be unwittingly pulled into a cyber conflict between Ukraine and Russia when your systems start being used to attack Russia. Wait, so your own systems could be used? Yep. It, like in this, can you explain like who this could impact? Anyone? Any? Yeah, yeah. I mean, double click on that. You know, people are looking. Uh, they they were looking for poorly configured Docker instances, and um, the way Docker uh, or containers work, right? Um, what this is is an infrastructure, uh, cyber infrastructure, and, and IT infrastructure, where you can basically deploy a little container, right? So think about it like on a container ship. Uh, where they've got all those thousands of different containers on, on the ship. And so each container has a different job. And so you could deploy one container to be your web server and another container to be your database server. Well, what this threat actor was doing was deploying containers that would conduct distributed denial of service attacks against Russian businesses. So they would they would use your your IT infrastructure to flood a you know series of Russian banks and government servers with just a mess of traffic. Um, so many more questions. Um, okay, so I want to also just bring up, um, you know, maybe a bit more thing, a few more things here domestically. Like, I know you did some work into the investigation into the 2016 DNC hacks. Um, we have midterms coming up, like how much, um, of a risk is this or, or a threat is cyber, um, to election season? Is this something that we're going to have to, this going to be just part of every season or cycle going forward? What do you make of it? Yeah, it's, and it's not just in the U S we've seen it globally. Um, we just saw this in Colombia. There was a presidential runoff election and they were, there was uh, fake news being created to try to make it look like one of the candidates was, uh, friends with Pablo Escobar. And so, you know, I think we've seen targeting of, of UK um, uh, government personnel as well that's been tied to some of this activity. So it, it is a very real concern. Um, disinformation, misinformation has been uh, leveraged, you know, even in the 2020 campaign, you might remember that there was this fake Proud Boys video that was being circulated. Um, that was actually the work of Iranian threat actors who were looking to cause disruption in the U.S. election process. So, you know, I think a lot of people kind of when they hear election hacking, they think somebody's going to break into the voting machines and change the vote. The reality is quite different. What the reality is, is that they're going to try to create narratives or stories that uh, will either cause us to question the candidates or more, more likely try to question the legitimacy of the election. And as that happens, that's, you know, from a Russia perspective, their goal is to create confusion and chaos in the U.S. so that we can't be an effective threat to Russian security or, or Russian uh, intentions in Europe or elsewhere in the globe. And I think that more and more countries are starting to look at how can they effectively use those techniques, you know, look at something like what's happening with China and Taiwan uh, or Iran and the nuclear deal. There is a lot of good reason why they would want the U.S. to be thrown into chaos around an election cycle. Mm -hmm. And I guess some of the ways of doing that, is that like the deep fakes? This is playing out on social media. Like, let's explore it a bit further. Yeah, I think deep fakes would be an interesting uh, one there. I know that we've seen some of that in the war in Ukraine, where uh, audio deep fake technology was used to um, create a realistic sounding voice of Ukrainian diplomats that was used to talk to uh, foreign diplomats. Um, you know, so I think that this is kind of really just on the uh, the cusp of being a problem. I, I, you know, I think they're, they're playing with it and it's not quite as reliable. I think there was a Zelensky deep fake as well that was attempted. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, 
there's some some ways to detect it and, and and otherwise but you know at a much simpler level just you know things like what we were talking about data weaponization um taking a bunch of data hacking in stealing data and then using that to launder misinformation or disinformation so again right imagine we steal a bunch of information uh on a candidate and uh it's let's say it's a senator that's 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 going to be running in this midterm election steal a bunch of information on that candidate from that candidate and you release that well if there's a, a whole mess of information that is legitimately stolen from that candidate or their campaign or whatever it might be and then you start layering in fake information because it's already in a bucket of information that's verifiable that looks you know legitimate and is realistic and may you know maybe even the candidate themselves said oh we were compromised and our data was stolen well when they start putting fake information into that they're laundering it through and that is a huge problem right because it you know you have legitimacy and credibility that the data is uh real but now there's fake data so how do you prove that some of the data that was stolen from you and is being leaked to the internet is not real right that's a that's a tough story to sell how do you uh, how like how would you be able to discern is that where you can use machine learning to come in and help or to discern if it's if real it's, yeah um, if it's real or no, not. i think you know you need to be able to go through and effectively uh show the you know show your work and be like here's all the files that were on this particular system and it's clear that these files are not real or there is some metadata in this file that makes us you know believe that this is not consistent with the metadata in all of the other files let me take a quick explainer here so what i mean by metadata if you look at a word document for example um and you 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 right click on it and go to the properties or however you want to get to the properties for that file it'll have the author information the the first opened last opened last edited like there's a bunch of data about that file metadata is data about data and so if you look at the metadata from thousands of files that get released from some target and there's a couple of files that are not consistent in terms of metadata and the you know, the narrative of that data is not consistent with what you would expect to be real, then you can start to use that to to make the case that this is clearly not really part of this data leak. But um, it is a huge challenge. And I think it, you know, the, the bigger concern too, is that it takes a lot of time to be able to demonstrate that. And when that information is breaking in a news cycle, you don't have time. You don't have time to be able to say, oh, you know, like, let me explain what metadata is and why this information isn't real you know, it, it gets wiped, wiped away and the, the story kind of takes off. Yeah. And a lot of people wouldn't even know like what metadata is or like how you just broke it down there. And I am uh, certainly not a computer scientist. So. Yeah. And, and also if there, there's uh, biases, right? So if there's confirmation bias, like if you're like, this guy is dirty and I know he's dirty and then this information leaks and they, there's something in there that makes it seem that, oh, this, this guy is dirty. You've got this confirmation bias where you're saying, okay, this proves what I knew to be true. So I'm going to ignore other information that might prove that it's not true because I like I already think that this story is true and this is the path that I'm going to follow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they take advantage, the threat actors take advantage of people's biases uh, when they're doing these information operations in order to really kind of, you know, get uh, get the story that they want out there. Yeah. And by the time you figure out that it wasn't real, one, nobody really cares anymore, right? And two, the election's over, the, the midterms are over, and this, you know, th this candidate's left trying to, to pull back, uh, you know, pull the pieces of their life back together. Yeah. Um, okay, so how about social media trolls? I know this is an area you've done work in. How big of a problem is it? How prolific is it? And what's being done about it? Um, man, we're all over the place here, huh? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I know a lot. No, no, it's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, social media trolls, um, I, I think there's lots of ways that this this happens, right? There's so much different social media out there, whether you're looking at uh, Twitter or Reddit or Instagram or Facebook. Um, they all have different flavors of, of trolls and, and, you know, different reasons for it. You know, it might be 
advertising and marketing related. It could be nation state. It could be criminal. And, you know, I think um, the one that I've spent the most time looking at personally has been Twitter. And so in, in my experience, you know, I, I've, I've looked pretty closely at the different um, campaigns, some of the, the different things that, that, that are out there. And, um, you know, I, I think that you, it's clear, you know, we know about the IR, um, IRA, the, uh, the, the Russian troll farms that are out there. And, you know, in my mind, the way that those work is that there's just like warehouses filled with people and they've got thousands of these fake personas, tens of thousands of these fake personas, and they've got like a board and on the board is a bunch of topics that they're supposed to create this, you know, troll type content around. And so it, it's almost like, um, like chat roulette or something. So it'll like spin around and all of a sudden a new Twitter persona comes up, they generate some unique content based off of the list of things that they're supposed to be trolling. And then once they send it, it automatically takes all of the other personas and they amplify it, right? They retweet it and they like it. And that builds up the momentum around that topic. And, you know, in the instant that that happens, another persona pops up and then they create some other unique content. So I think that there, it, it's a mix of automation as well as, you know, humans that are generating some of that content. Mm -hmm. When you say mix of automation, I take it artificial intelligence involved. Is that involved in like the image generation or even the text? What you do you don't know. I, I think it's literally just, you know, automatically taking the, uh, the, uh, the accounts that, that are, that they have access to and, um, you know, retweeting and, and liking the thing that just got published. And, you know, you can buy, uh, at least a couple of years ago, you could buy thousands of Twitter accounts with phone verifications and APIs for a couple of dollars in cryptocurrency. Wow. So think about that, right? You could build your own, uh, your own troll factory to just, you know, get everybody to listen to your podcast for like $5. So you can use it for a multitude of different things. Sure, absolutely. Wow. Um, okay, so you've obviously seen a lot in your career. Um, gosh, what is what is maybe the scariest cyber-related attack or effort that you're aware of that was prevented? And maybe some of the implications if it were not if it were successful. Sorry. Hmm. I don't know that I have a good answer for that, that I'm, I'm allowed to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of that stuff, you know, if it, if it's not public and, and people don't know about it, then uh, you can't really talk about it. I, I, I could tell you, um, you know, that over the 20 years or so I've been in this business that I've seen some pretty crazy attacks that have been successful. Um, and, and a lot of those have made the news. I think that the one that for me really was just a game changer was the hack in 2016 of the DNCC. Because, you know, if you remember back to like the Obama and McCain campaign in 2008, they announced that they had been compromised, that, that data was stolen and it was probably a nation state and it was probably for espionage purposes. And you know, I think we all in this industry understood that that happens, right? If there's an election, foreign nation states are going to try to hack into the candidates' campaigns to understand who they're talking to, what their positions might be if they get elected on China or Taiwan or Russia or NATO, whatever it might be, that there'd be some, some intrinsic value in knowing that so that when that person were to be elected, that you would understand what they were going to be saying and how, how you could react to that effectively. When the 2016 hacks occurred, um, this was in, it started for us in about April or so of 2016. And I remember I got past the malware and I, um, I'm actually the person that named Fancy Bear, if, if you've ever heard the term for that, one of the Russian threat actors that we associate with the main intelligence directorate of the military, the GRU, uh, we tracked that as Fancy Bear. And I, I, I had named it Fancy Bear because I had 
been running and uh, listening to Iggy Azalea and uh, she had the song uh, I'm So Fancy. I forget what was the name of it, but yep. um, <laughs> there was a, uh, I shouldn't be admitting that I listened to this, but uh, so I'm, running, I'm listening to this song and um, as long as I don't sing it, we're okay. Um, and so I'm, I'm listening to this song and uh, the malware that they were using at the time was called Sophacy. And one of my buddies called me up and he said, hey, what do you guys call Sophacy? And we were researching it, but we didn't have a name for it yet. And in my head, we knew it was a bear and we were going to call it a bear. And uh, in my head, like Sophacy sounded like I'm so fancy. So I was like, Iggy Bear. And I was like, no, that's a terrible name. Fancy Bear. And he was like, all right, cool, thanks. And so then I had to call the, the, our main analyst that was working on this. And I was like, hey, um, that new bear is going to be called Fancy Bear because um, I got put on the spot. I just went for a run. So you can make fun of my musical taste if you want, but we're calling it Fancy Bear. And uh, so we kind of had been looking at this malware. So in April 2016, I get past this malware. I think it was April, it might've been May, but I get past this malware and they're like, this was found at the DNCC, can you take a look at it? And so whenever we do an incident response engagement as a company, uh, the Intel team that I run is, is pulled into it. So I start looking at this malware and I immediately knew it was something that we call X agent and it was definitively the work of Fancy Bear. So I said, oh, this is Fancy Bear. And they were like, oh, okay, well, we just found it at the DNCC. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense. They would, they would, of course, want to know um, if Hillary is elected, what her position is going to be, et cetera. Well, in June of 2016, we had wrapped everything up and we put out this blog post. And when we put this blog post out, we were kind of like, all right, cool. Like everybody knows that they were hacked and it was Fancy Bear and, and uh, Cozy Bear and, and we're in good shape here. Like we'll, we'll, everybody will read this and it'll be interesting. At no point did I even think that the next day I would wake up to this fake persona called Guccifer 2.0. Now, a hacktivist persona seldom comes out of nowhere with a massive operation, right? Like this is this is uh, a cover. And so this Guccifer 2.0 thing pops up. They start leaking information and they're 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 putting out this like mis disinformation, misinformation and that blew my mind coming back to your question because it was like we had tracked these threat actors all over the globe we you know as i said there's 185 that we track today and very rarely do they actually go and just go offensive and and take credit for what they've done and start trying to weaponize the information and at that time there really wasn't any good example of that so i remember the next day um that that really blew my mind and changed my understanding of <laughs> everything uh because you know this was a threat actor that got outed and they didn't just kind of skulk away and, and and hope nobody noticed they were like nope we're a hacked we're, we're a hacker we're, we're called gucci for 2.0 and we're gonna start leaking this information and that was like whoa this is this is a different level this is this is four-dimensional chess right here whoa so like that's interesting. You call yeah, a different level, four dimensional chest and chess, and they took credit for it. Um, why is it that why did why did they why do they usually not take credit or like why why explain to me like why that was such an unusual? Well, thing. it was historically espionage, right? Mm -hmm. It was it was uh, cyber operations to steal sensitive information to inform political and military and diplomatic decision making. This was different, right? This was misinformation, disinformation, information warfare, where they were going to come and now start trying to disrupt the U.S. election. And, you know, I, I think that that really set the tone for what's happened over the last eight years or so, um, or six years, whatever it's been, um, because that kind of is the new threat that we're dealing with, right? We're dealing with the fact that these threat actors will come in, they will steal information, they will try to influence public opinion and drive a wedge between the different groups in the US. They did it around Brexit. They've done it in in France uh, with, uh, in, in the last election with uh, Marine uh, Le Pen. Um, they've done it uh, across Moldova. So they're, they're driving all of these fake disinformation, misinformation operations. 
And, you know, the Russians have been doing this, by the way, since like the 1920s, and they've been really good at it. But this was the first time that their disinformation, misinformation, you know, what I would broader call information operations really started to be front and center with a cyber aspect to it. Do you think it's only going to get worse? And what can folks do to like prepare or protect themselves? Um, I do think it's going to get worse. Um, I, I think that more and more countries are starting to understand how to do this and are thinking about how to do this. You know, look no, no further than the last election with the fake Proud Boys video that came out that was associated with Iran. Um, you know, I think we need to, as a uh, society, uh, be more tolerant of each other and be able to have, you know, real discourse on these topics and understand like that this information, you can't just react to it. You have to ask questions about this information and understand the authenticity and the origin and, and pedigree of the information before you just start jumping into those, uh, those biases that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. It's a good point about just like critical thinking too and asking questions. Um, yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's the biggest, <laughs> that's the biggest fight that, that I see people having. Right. I mean, uh, you know, the, look at the Proud Boys thing, for example, right? A lot of people thought that uh, uh, former President Trump was, you know, associated with this right wing kind of ideology. So they create a video that shows these right wingers supporting uh, him. And that becomes the uh, impetus for people to now start to say, oh, well, look, this is clearly like what I thought was the case is is the case is true is real. And that is the dangerous thing, right? If we don't start asking questions and trying to verify information, then, you know, that's, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. I have just kind of a, um, a, since we're having this conversation, like a random question that came up just from listening to you, like you going back to fancy bear and, and sorry to like jump around here, but I feel like I'm just learning a lot in the process. What are, how do you come up with the naming conventions? What's the deal with Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear? I've heard you mention other names throughout this conversation for different uh, groups or adversarial groups, the ones that you all track. What, what's behind the naming convention? Well, yeah, that's a fun story. So, um, you know, if you go back to when we started this, this company uh, in 2011, there was kind of everybody called them advanced persistent threats, as I mentioned. And so the predominant way that people tracked them was APT1, APT3. And when we launched the company, we really wanted to um, be clear about what we were saying, right? So if it was China, we wanted to say China or um, in our parlance, we started this cryptonym system. So we track all Chinese activities, Panda, all Russian activities, Bear. And usually we're using animals that are representative of that nation, right? So panda is something that's very much associated with China, bear, et cetera. And then the, you know, the fancy, the cozy, the uh, whatever it might be, we, did, we track each of these groups dis discreetly. So there's groups that we know definitively are part of the Ministry of State Security in China or are part of the PLA Strategic Support Forces or part of the SVR, the, the GRU, different uh, Russian intelligence services. And across the globe, we're able to make some of these linkages. So each time that we create a, a distinct group that we can track by their trade craft and their, their tools and their targets, then we come up with a unique name for it. And so, you know, Fancy Bear, you heard the origin there was, was my, uh, my, my power song while running, uh, Cozy Bear. Um, one of the other vendors in the space was tracking uh, that actor under, uh, they had something called Cozy Car, uh, which was how they, they, they tracked Cozy. So we just took the name that others in the industry already knew this activity as and then attached it to Bear because we wanted to be clear, like we're talking about the Russian nation state actors. That makes sense. So it's like a way of codifying like, okay, this is where the origin of it and the description. Okay, I was just curious because I didn't know the, the full backstory there. Um, and others, you know, today, no, it's, it, I think it's a really interesting uh, challenge in the industry, too, because there's so many different names for things. And so, like, different companies will use things from the periodic tables um, or they'll use colors and, and other names. So they, But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these things, whether you're using the periodic table or you're using colors or you're using ABT and a number, you're kind of obfuscating the origin. 
And, and I think it's important when we're talking to our customers about these threats that we're, we're saying like, hey, this is Russia and you're in, in the energy business and you're you know, transiting gas through Europe, like you're gonna like need to know that you're dealing with Russia here because you, that helps you understand what their intention is, what they're gonna do next and what the impact to your business is. And so, you know, that's been kind of one of the things that we've been very uh, adamant about when we talk about these threats and why it's important to understand who these threat actors are. Yeah, I guess just to wrap up um, here and I, I thank you again, because I feel like you've um, illuminated a lot of things that I just frankly was not fully aware of. Um, why should folks who are listening or watching, why should they care about this and what can they do on an individual level? Well, um, at, at the individual level, you know, I think most people's biggest concern is probably, you know, fraud. Um, and, and, you know, the, the best thing you can do to protect yourself, to protect your family, um, I'd say to make sure that you are using different passwords for every account is, is probably the, the number one thing you can be doing. Um, a lot of the attacks that we see, they steal credentials and then use those credentials, that identity uh, to, to, to conduct further attacks. And so by using something simple like a password manager of some sort, um, I won't go through, there's a bunch out there, but you can use a password manager and use that to create for each time you sign up for a new vendor or a new subscription or um, you know, you're, you start uh, listening, you know, subscribing to Julia's blog, then, you know, you create a different account for every single uh, uh, log on and a different password. And that way, if one of them gets compromised, they can't then use the same password to log into your email into your bank. Um, that's the biggest problem people have. If I, you know, when I, when I talk to large groups of people, I'm like, who do, who reuses their password? And a couple of people put their hand up and I'm like, look around, anybody whose hand is not up is a liar. True. Because Everybody reuses passwords. Um, so don't, don't do that. The second thing is use multi-factor authentication. So when you sign up for different services and they're like, do you want us to use like Google Auth or Duo or um, send you a text message, which is not optimal, but um, use a second factor of authentication because that makes it harder for an attacker to steal your password and then to use it. Um, so those are probably the two most important things that I generally tell people. Um, at the enterprise level, if you've got a business or, or, or a small business, then you know now we're into making sure that you have good uh, hygiene, that you've got the right tools in place. Um, one of the biggest things that we've seen impacting as we're talking about data theft, data extortion, one of the biggest game changers has been identity protection and zero trust, which um, this effectively, um, to kind of simplify it as much as I can, we used to say trust, but verify. And what that means is when an attacker gets in, uh, once they have access, once they've kind of cleared that first perimeter, they're trusted. And then you want to verify that they are who they are, right? Are they logging in from someplace that they shouldn't be or, or something like that? The new paradigm needs to be verify then trust meaning we have to go through a very stringent uh, verification of identity before we give somebody access to resources and infrastructure and, and things and and that is um, the implementation of things like zero trust and identity protection um, and then using machine learning versus signature based antivirus if you're reliant on signature antivirus uh, you know that's really a 90s technology uh, that is is dead and so that type of uh, technology is not going to help you. And then also threat hunting. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's 98 minutes that it takes for the average time that a threat actor makes access to when they can move into your system, move to another system. And so threat hunting means that you're out there looking for threats and engaging them. Um, if I was going to give you a real life kind of uh, approximation of this, right? If you go to the airport uh, overseas, generally, I, I don't know that we do it, uh, such an effective job here, but when you go overseas, um, they start talking to you as you're walking into the airport, right? They're engaging you because they recognize that if they start asking you questions and you start getting squirrely, that maybe you're a problem. And so they create these layers of defense 
and they're out looking for problems before they make it into security, before they make it into the airport. That's what we're talking about with threat hunting, right? Going out and as soon as you see a weird, you know, flag get raised by one of your your security tools or something like that, that they start investigating that because they only have 98 minutes from the time that threat actor makes access to the time that they can uh, move laterally and, and become a much bigger problem. Um, and then finally, having the intelligence, understanding uh, who the threat actors are, how they're operating and what they're doing and how their their tools and tactics and techniques are changing uh, enables you to better defend your business, but better defend what matters to you. Well, Adam Myers, CrowdStrikes, Senior Vice President of Intelligence, I thank you so much for just giving us a, basically a masterclass on all things uh, cybersecurity. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, my pleasure. It was great talking to you. Likewise.